Welcome, welcome, and welcome to another episode of MikeStewart.Live. So glad uh, to be able to do this. Oh, I'm excited about today's show. As, as people are getting in their seats, I've seen some people getting in their seats right now. Um, you know, if you look over my shoulder, I always remember, there it is, it's over there. Um, you Folks that know me know I've been around the music business a long time. And, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, a lot of people have asked me over the years, they said, is that really your gold record? And I go, well, yeah, it's the only one I ever got. I was, I was in a, involved with a project with a couple of friends of mine, Jerry Buckner and Gary Garcia, and they had a novelty record. In fact, you can see it back there, Pac-Man Fever. Um, and it was a big hit record, and it was recorded in Atlanta at uh, uh, Studio One, which was the home of uh, Atlanta Rhythm Section, and it was the home of uh, uh, so many big story uh, songs, big hits. And... Uh, this is a person that I wanted to have today. So he, let me tell you why I wanted to have this, my good friend Rodney Mills on this uh, episode today. Number one, um, when I was a kid and he was already involved with so much music that I loved at the time, uh, he was the engineer at uh, Dorval Studio One. Dorval is an, uh, a suburb of Atlanta. So Dorval was basically Atlanta. And, and uh, because I got involved with the Bill Lowry group, and some of the artists that Bill had, especially uh, one of my dear friends, Tommy Rowe, uh, I got to come to the Atlanta Rhythm Section Studio to work on a record. And that's the Rodney I met that day. There he was in front of that Har Harrison board, and he was the guy, and I didn't know all the things he did, but, but you know, Rodney was involved with so much music that came out of Atlanta all the way back into the 70s. You can see that he was... Uh, he and Al Cooper uh, did Sweet Home, all the Alabama, uh, not Sweet Home Alabama, but um, yeah, well, it was Sweet Home Alabama, but the Leonard Skinner records. Uh, so Rodney was just the, the real deal. He was the first real audio engineer that I ever met. And God, he was so nice to me as a kid. He, you know, I'd ask him questions and we, you know, we were interested in, you know, how did he do something? What microphones did he use and things like that? And he always answered questions. And so he became a friend and a colleague. And in fact, we built a studio about two or three blocks away from where Rodney's studio is. is. Well, you know, Rodney is still doing mastering. In fact, if you want to know how to get in touch with uh, Rodney, you know, guess what? He has RodneyMills.com. There he is, still in front of the board, still got the most amazing ears ever. And I mean, I could just uh, brag on him all day. In fact, look at this ticker tape. He did Color and Father for the Winstons. And probably one of the most famous things that he taught, gets interviewed about is the Amen Brother break. Uh, he, he was the engineer of Sweet Home Alabama, Freebird, Atlanta Rhythm Section, 38 Special. I mean, my gosh, I don't even know all the records that he's played on or produced, but Rodney is my mentor. He's my friend. He's a, a, just an amazing, high, talented amazing engineer. And, you know, he was the Atlanta audio guy. You know, I, I claim to be the internet audio guy, but uh, basically he was the Atlanta audio guy that was my hero from back in the day. So I wanted to have him come on here and just talk a little bit about, you know, microphones and audio and what mastering is and how that could apply to uh, what we're doing online these days. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always go to, um, uh, you can always go to the um, um, uh, comments box and leave some questions, you know, later for uh, for Rodney if you think of some things today. So I'm going to bring to the virtual stage here my good friend and audio engineer extraordinaire, Mr. Rodney Mills. Let me get rid of this picture here. Give me a second. I'm going to pull that down. And here he is, Rodney <laughs> Mills, all the way from Florida. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. How you doing, Mike? Well, you know, this thing that I'm doing here, most of the folks that, that come in and watch this, and we've got, we've got a nice little audience showing up here. Um, I notified them that I was going to have you. And, and of course we, I want to talk about the music business and maybe a couple of little fun stories. I know two fun stories I want to get documented here, but um, what most of the folks do here uh, at my show is they record narration and, you know, for podcasts, for voiceovers, for YouTube videos, for what we call sales videos. So talk about when you used to record voice, 
what were little tips and tricks that you used to do to get the best quality vocal sound all the way back to the beginning? You know, what, what, what type of microphones and, and what are some inexpensive microphones you know of today that could be used for those things? Uh, well, in the beginnings, uh, I had the opportunity when I first started uh, really engineering, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Neumann microphones. And I think that that was a kind of a curse to a certain extent because they, I took for granted how how good they sounded because it was kind of like they were there. And when I went to work full time in a recording studio, the Maurice Lefebvre, Lefebvre Sound in Atlanta, and he had all uh, the Telefunken Forty Sevens and for vocal mics and and those things kind of work good no matter how bad I was. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, it's kind of like, so yeah, so when you start off with something that well, you know, I think you uh, tend to take it for granted a little bit. And so the, uh, so I think it was more challenging when I, when we built Studio One and I did not have all those microphones around me, but still working with vocalists and everything, it's all according to the genre of music, how, you know, you have to take each vocalist kind of on their own because some vocalists uh, that have done a lot of recording, they certainly have more mic savvy than uh, somebody that's never done much recording. And uh, and I think the people that I've worked with that had a lot of uh, history of uh, singing in a recording studio, they naturally know how to get the sound of their voice sounding good in their headphones and everything. And they can kind of help you out as an engineer because if they say sing something really quiet, they know to lean in just a little bit and mm. they're going to sing something loud. They're going to back up just a little bit. So those are the people, those are the people I enjoy working with because they kind of like kept me from working so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did you, you know, we used to, when I would started talking about microphones to people who are not music people, because the majority of the people that, that I worked with for the last few years in the internet world were doing just narration, just spoken word. And, um, you know, I used to say, you know, to get the best quality, you want a large diaphragm microphone, a microphone uh, that has a, a, a big sound catcher, which is the diaphragm. Was So that was true. And, and for folks that don't know what a Neumann microphone or a Telefunken, those were those amazing extremely expensive German microphones that have been around since Frank Sinatra. I, I, when was the first Norman Telefunken's uh, that we know what they, they still kind of look the same today. Yeah. They, uh, I think that I know of, uh, a friend of ours that's passed away now, Mike Clark, you know, he, he uh, actually collected a couple of the Normans. I think were probably manufactured in the late forties or mid in the forties. Uh, they were kind of bottle top, what they call bottle top, and that you actually see them in some of Adolf Hitler's uh, speeches. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, but those those microphones for the human for the voice for a vocal and everything, where it's spoken or sung, are just uh, a great sounding microphone. The fact is that uh, most of those microphones have such a great proximity effect. And the proximity effect is when you get in really close on a microphone, it makes your voice sound bigger and and sometimes too big. So you, but it, that you know is a sound that uh, those those mics could handle real well. And you uh, and you could you know working with a singer, whether it be a singer or a uh, just a voiceover and everything, I think you would work with them to find that magic spot to where they're. Uh, it's like radio. Uh, guys, you know, the announcers, they know when their voice sounds best in, in relationship to the microphone. And so that's something you work out over a period of time. And uh, I don't think it ever got to a point, you know, where I'd, if I had to start with one microphone, it would probably be a Norman UA7. And, mm -hmm. But there are certainly a, a tons of microphones out there that sound real good. I've kind of stuck with those over the years, and I only own three microphones. <laughs> <laughs> one's a Norman U87, one's a Shure SM7, and the other one's like a, just a Shure uh, 56. 
So, well, and, and for folks that don't know the the uh, uh, the two Shure microphones, which is spelled S H U R E, um, uh, the seven is it's not that expensive. I think it's three four hundred dollars. It's not that expensive, and I've I have I've leaned on that microphone, and I've had to do some really tough vocals that the vocals did not sound real good coming through other microphones, and I've done fooled around and experimented and everything, and the SM7 seemed to be a, kind of a band-aid that you could uh, use in difficult situations. It's a good all-around microphone, no matter what you use it on. So, so the uh, a lot of podcasters, which are people that watch this um, this live stream, uh, the SM the Shure uh, SM7 uh, is good for. You could make a record with it. You could make a, a record today, and it would be quality enough to for a master recording. Absolutely, and it, you know the fact it's got a built-in windscreen, and you can do uh, roll-offs or boosts on the microphone itself. It's quite versatile in itself. In addition to you being able to process it through a console or something. So, are are you still recording vocals there um, in your studio, or are you just mostly just doing processing, which um, you call mastering? Is right. what are you doing these days? Well, uh, the uh, the majority of the work I do nowadays is mastering. Whereas people send me their recordings, they're already recorded, they're already mixed. And usually they just send me a stereo file, just like whatever, whatever you make, but it, a wave file of the song. And uh, I take that and try to make that sound as good as I can make it sound. As a good friend of mine, Jeff Carlisi, uh, played with 38 specially. And I tried to explain it to him many years ago, and I was telling him all this EQ I do here, the compression here and everything, and I'd play it before and after. And he says, I got it. It's, it's like a loudness button on my stereo. <laughs> <laughs> the loudest, well, it always makes it sound better. <laughs> I said, no. Uh, well, yeah, kind of. It's a lot, I think it's a lot more and a lot better than just a uh, loudness. Well, it's, it, it's according to who, you know, sometimes the stuff I get is, uh, is done really well. Sometimes it's, it's not. And it's kind of like, uh, it's, me trying to dig in there sometimes to see if I can kind of help the whole process out a little bit. And, uh, well, anyway, go ahead. A, a mastering engineer is a guy who listens to something that is a, a, a finished product. In other words, it's, it can be all the instruments and the music, all the vocals. So do you have a lot of control o over fixing things and, and well, uh, changing things? Well, the, the thing that you can do, I've got enough stuff to really screw somebody's <laughs> songs up. Uh, uh, or I can slowly get in there and dig around in it and everything. And it's like it is, they say there's not enough bass and there's too much kick. And it's trying to really kind of find these little, little areas, frequency areas that you could kind of pull up, pull down. Or you need to compress this little uh, frequency range more than others. Uh, you need to add some uh, equalization, maybe a little bit, to uh, to improve the uh, clarity of the thing. You know, to me, it's kind of like my I listen to stuff, and if I listen to it really loud, you know, it's kind of like, wow, that sounds. I can hear everything, but it's kind of like not everybody listens like totally loud. So you got to kind of get things. Uh, sounding pretty good a lower level and everything so and every genre of music's a little bit different you know it's kind of like uh rock and roll is certainly different than say uh hip-hop rap and uh and this so it's kind of like uh it's not like you totally ahead of time you got these things pigeonholed this is what i'm gonna do to it because it's this genre of music because a lot of times i i can't really in my to my ear, I can't pick that genre, exact genre they're in. So it's kind of like you just adapt yourself to that music while you're working on it and everything and try to get it to sound as good as you can. And usually uh, the sign, best thing to me is I've sent it to people and sometimes it's kind of like I got my fingers crossed because I've changed it the way it sounds quite a bit. And a lot of time, most all the time, it's an improvement. They really appreciate what I've uh, done to kind of help them with the overall process. Well, well it, it, 
the, the thing, thing that, uh oh, I'm getting a little echo here. Let me pull my volume back. Um, oh, shoot. I don't know what calling that echo. Hey, that shows me. Um, yeah, but the, the main thing that, that I, I just wanted to, you know, let folks know about is that there's, you know, when we started recording, it was all analog tape. And it, there wasn't a whole lot of computerization uh, programming, and there was no computerized processing. No. Um, there was, you know, uh, a piece of equipment that now has become software. So are you pretty much all software controlling now, or do you still use uh, equipment? Not, not totally, but I'm a lot more there than, uh, than I've ever been, and, uh, mainly because I've got a few pieces of gear in Atlanta that's a little bit too cumbersome to bring down here, but I have the, uh, the equivalent of that hardware piece and software. And the two things that I mostly use, uh, I've compared them and both, they sound, it's really close. The software stuff is really close to the hardware. And where it's the same, I'm not, I don't know about that, but it behaves in the same way. If I turn a knob up on the software, it does the same thing to my ear that if I did for I was turning the actual hardware piece to either boost or cut or frequency select and all that. It's very similar. Uh, it, it, well, the computer stuff, you know, to my experience and my ear is just, you know, amazing. Um, uh, what they have figured out how to plug in to computers and, and they actually, I don't know if some of the ones you have, they actually have animations of the actual equipment so that when you're controlling it, you actually feel like you're working with the old hardware that we were used to 30 and 40 years ago. Um, and so, so the thing is, is the equip, the equipment or the, at least here's what hasn't changed. The, the, the tools and the software and the computers have all advanced, but the ears and the, the, um, <laughs> The ability to know whether it's, I mean, just because you have equipment doesn't mean it sounds good. I mean, there's something, folks, you got to know about this man you're witnessing today. And I'm so glad he's sharing his wisdom with uh, with you today. And you better ask him some questions in the comments area because I don't know if I'll ever get him to come back. Well, <laughs> you know, and doing what I do and everything, uh, Mike, I think it's, uh, I always think in, I, I guess I was thinking analog terms, you know, it's kind of like, so it makes it a little bit easier. And fortunately, most of these plugins and everything have kind of made it uh, kind of user friendly to people that have a uh, old enough history that they can remember what the real stuff did. But there's some of the newer stuff too that does things that none of the old analog gear did. So you have to kind of, uh, some of those things I have to kind of get, get them and kind of go through a process of learning how to use them the best way. And sometimes in my mastering chain, they can find a place, but most often they can't, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, uh, this doesn't really sound any better than what I'm already doing. So I just kind of pass on this particular plug in or whatever. Well, well, the talent that Rodney has and, and mastering engineers is they have the ears to know when it's right and when it's wrong. And, and that's, that's what, I mean, you know, I was, I'll be honest with you. I was, uh, before this, um, knew you were coming on, I went back and listened to a bunch of old stuff, uh, that you did. And I thought, my gosh, it still sounds good. I mean, I listened to most of the Winston's album and I mean, you were in your twenties when you recorded that. And, uh, and, uh, I, ironically, I mean, the, you can hear everything. Now there's a lot of music things that uh, a lot of the folks that watch this show don't know about, but I remember there was uh, like a bass all the way on the one side of the speakers. I mean, it seemed like, I think in the sixties and seventies, it was cool to really make things stereo. Put <laughs> well, to be honest with you, the, you know, you go back to the, the Winston's uh, was 1969 and I, their whole album, was, whole album was done on four track including the big hit single we had with them was a four track. And I always tell the story, you know, that we had recorded the basic rhythm section. We had done the a solo on the thing. Then we had the vocalists to come in. They had their own, the lead vocal had their own track, but we bounced this stuff and all we could do in the last track, we'd assembled a full uh, horn session section and a string section, violins, violas, and, the, and et cetera. 
in live musicians in the studio, as well as four background singers. And one of the background singers played tambourine behind the back because it was so loud. And that was all on one track, one pass. Yeah. So everything had to be gotten together. Everybody knew their parts. The other parts were good. Because if anybody messed up or screwed up or anything, you had to redo everybody involved in that track back back to the beginning, so to speak. Because mm-hmm. there was there was on that particular big hit song we had called "Color and Father." There was no space that you could actually punch in anywhere. There was stuff going on all the time. So I, I'm somewhat amazed that we were able to do <laughs> the things we did. And I don't. And to me, my thinking nowadays, there's no way I could reproduce that now because uh, my mind will let me go there. You know, that's what back then, that's what you had to do. And uh, you were limited. Yeah. You were limited, but you didn't know that. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you know, you, you just tried to make a good sounding recording, a good sounding record. Exactly. And, and you tried to not make mistakes. And, uh, um, you know, it's amazing. Um you know, there's a, if you go on YouTube right now, I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, Pete, there must be some software that lets you isolate tracks out of mono mixes. And I've been listening to Beatle isolated guitar parts and bass parts, and and songs that I love, the guitars are really out of tune. <laughs> right. But I don't care because it just it's just magic. It's it's still magic to me. No. Um, well, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna do a little. This is this is a little sponsorship. I'm gonna talk about right now on February 13th. This this show is brought to you by NextLevelPCOMarketing.com. That is a live marketing event that uh, I'm doing with my good friend uh, Rodney. Did you ever hear of Milton Crabapple with Bill Lowry? Yes. Okay. Very much so. Well, Hal Coleman is Milton Crabapple, and he's my partner in the Next Level PCO Marketing. Oh, wow. We do online marketing. In fact, we'd love to have you as a guest. I'll send you a link to it. But anyway, go to nextlevelpcomarketing.com. It's going to be a full uh, virtual event on how to use the internet and how to use uh, my parts, how to use audio and video to market houses, how to say the right words. And uh, he, he's still Milton Crabapple, but his real world is is teaching bug guys how to improve their business. So there's our little <laughs> little commercial some, for the show. I did some recording with Hal back in the day. We went up to Nashville and did some. Oh, songs. did you do? Yeah. Did, did you work with uh, the session, uh, John Willis and... and um, yes. Okay. Steve Nathan, John Steve Willis. Nathan and all those guys. Owen uh, Hill. Well, you know, I, I did a session up here recently with John Willis, and, and we were talking about Milton Crap, and he said, I played on uh, all of his records. He, in fact, Hal had a record called The Bird, uh, which was a big hit for Jerry Reed, and John played on that. So I didn't know you knew John, but that... Hey, John... All right. He's played everything, everything I've done up in Nashville. Oh, he's amazing. What an amazing... I mean, I'll tell you one thing. You throw a rock in this city, you hit a guitar player or a singer. <laughs> they're they're amazing people. Yeah. Um, all right. So I figured what we'd do is I'd, I'd like to at least do two more things, and then I'm going to uh, respect your time. But um, uh, what did... Let me ask you another little technical question as an sure. audio engineer. What do you do to keep from you know, popping the microphone. What, what do you, what, what did you used to recommend to people? Did you uh, back in the day have pop filters or did you get them to stand back? What, what was your take? Well, you know, the, the only pop filter I had back in the day, say I had a Norman uh, UA7 and there was a windscreen that was made out of foam that you could push up over the windscreen and everything. And I hated the way that sounded. So I hated the way it sounded. So I always, uh, uh, I would not use a windscreen of any kind. I would kind of turn the microphone, make try to find that place and everything. So when they did an explosive, you know, like a pop, you know, it would uh, jump out at you. Try to find, you know, even if it's a singing along, you know, they, they do a line. So, okay, you need to turn your head just a little bit when you say that word, or we just need to find a permanent uh, position that you've got an angle into that microphone. So you do not, hit that capsule straight on. Mm-hmm. If you hit it straight on, that's what's going to call us cause that, uh, that pop real loud pop now. And when I get stuff and everything, I listen to vocal tracks and I solo and it's pops in there. I can digitally go in there and kind of, uh, control those. So you don't hear those. Oh, okay. So, so there, but it's a process. 
but see that creates a, that creates a whole lot of work if there's a bunch of them in there, man. Yes. Goodness. So, um, um, but uh, but I use a windscreen now. You know, that's a little bit more transparent than the uh, than the old that big foam thing that you stuck on the microphone. See, I got my, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got still, the, even with that, you know, you, you still got to kind of somewhat times create an angle. The best sound to me is when you are singing straight on, but uh, it's just according to who the singer is and how many pops they do and all that stuff. Nowadays, it's kind of like I won't, I won't risk the uh, choice of a performance because there's a pop in it. Mm -hmm. If what they perform sounded real good, I'll just remove the pop digitally, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and take the performance. But that that just goes to prove that no matter you know uh, how good a microphone it is and 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 how a conscientious engineer it is, if a burst of air gets onto that capsule, it's just going to make that loud pop thud. Uh, yes. And, and if that, plus, you you risk risk the thing of, uh, with the uh, uh, condenser microphone and everything. If you get too much moisture on that capsule, it's going to crap out on you. It's going to either stop working or start sounding distorted and everything. And, and I had to send away a couple of Norman U87s to get them reconditioned because they'd gotten so much <laughs> spent on them, so to speak over the years. But, uh, I tried to work with vocalists without those things for a long time. And of course, now you got an infinite variety of windscreens that you can use will help that situation. Well, I want to document a couple of fun stories that have nothing to do with internet audio. They're just, <laughs> they're just a couple of fun stories and then anything that you want to contribute. And then if we have any questions, we'll take them. And I, I tried to keep the, you know, we're almost at a half an hour here, so I don't want to take up much more of your time, Rodney, but I'm just, okay. Know, we're good. Uh, I just, uh, just so honored to have you here. So number one, you know, when you were a kid and the Winstons came into Lefevre Studios there in Atlanta, Georgia, to cut that album, um, and they needed a, a B side. They recorded the old Amen. Um, I guess that was a spiritual. I don't even know if it if it was a public domain song or not. Yeah, it was, but it was, uh, I think it was public domain, so you could uh, republish it, whatever. And, uh, and, and it was an instrumental. It wasn't even a vocal. Yeah, no, they were, they're coming into the studio just to cut the song Color and Father, which was uh, R and B song of the year. Uh -huh. That went, that year was released. So so everybody thought that was a hit song and nobody ever thought, well, we're gonna release a single. You got an A side and you got a B side. We normally put a different song on the B side, so people that buy the forty five, they've got something else to listen to other than just the main ver main version of one song. So we cut cut the track on uh, Color and Father and said find it you know, somebody said, we got to cut a B-side. So what do we got? They didn't have any more original material. And so <laughs> I think uh, my manager I had when I was playing in a band, he was involved in that project. His name is Johnny B. And Johnny B was in the control room. And he says, why don't you guys play that instrumental thing uh, that I heard y'all play the other night in some club they were performing in. So that was the emphasis to cut uh, Amen, Amen Brother. And... Uh, I had no idea what we were getting into or what would become of that later on because I had completely forgotten that song and uh, recording it until somebody called me up and said, Ron, you, you know you recorded the biggest breakbeat in music history. I said, no. What? <laughs> well, they asked me, he said, you know the significance of the B-side of Color and Father? And I said, no, I don't even remember. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he proceeded this guy out of uh, North Carolina he came down and he brought a CD there was like 51 cuts on there that that beat there's eight measures of the drummer playing right by himself that that was incorporated in the, as a sample in these uh, 51 uh, different songs that he played me little pieces of and it's it's mind blowing I had no idea and, and well, it was 30 years later. So when you recorded that B side, now was it already was it already set up from Color Rain Father, or did you have a different session? No, I, I don't I necessarily remember that it was. I just remember we uh, it had to be pretty close around there. You know, it's kind of like I don't know whether we had gone through the whole 
uh, process of recording and overdubbing everything on Color and Father. Probably a little bit of that. And the, and the drums, I usually set up in the same place in the studio. So what wasn't a big deal to kind of set everything back up and, and record that song. And basically, it was only one or two takes of that song that we did. And, uh, and it was done, you know, because it's pretty much live uh, performance anyway. Do you, do you, you know, I bet you uh, kids today cook, uh, that really are into hip hop, which you you can see, you know, I'm not much of a hip hopper, but uh, <laughs> you look like one. <laughs> oh, I do, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but do you remember, you know, did you have uh, a lot of microphones on the drums, or because you know, the the snare and, uh, drum and the bass drum are are pretty pronounced in that drum break, which is They're I guess what was the appeal to the to the rappers. But do you remember how you set up the microphones that day? Basically, I do kind of remember where there was exact uh, microphones. Uh, we had the at Lefebvre Sound where it was recorded. There was a small choice of dynamic microphones and a large choice of uh, condenser microphones. So, mm -hmm. so it was a combination of both. Most most everything was like basically mic. You know, like uh, snare. Uh, there's one mic on the toms maybe maybe two mics one mic on the kick drum but it was kind of an ambient situation also that there was other musicians on the basic track so when it came time for the drummer to take that break there was a lot of uh interplay from just the ambience of the room around that sound and mm -hmm. it's a very distinct sound and once you hear it in any uh any song it's immediately identifiable and, uh, and it spawned a whole uh, genre of music over in England called uh, Jungle. And it's all based, that that genre of music is all based around those eight measures <laughs> of drums. That, that, that drummer and you had no idea what you were creating that day. And it, 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 no, it's just a, something they did. You know, he, play, he, he played those eight measures. It didn't do anything extraordinary. It's just, you know, the, you can hear the ride cymbal, the snare, and the kick really well and it's just a, it's a almost a phenomenon when you put it in with other instruments and add instruments around you can still get that uh right right well context it, there's there's a, a documentary on hip-hop that talks about the significance of it and it, it's just to, it's just i just wanted folks to know that you're you're hearing <laughs> and seeing the guy that was there the day it was created <laughs> Now I'll tell you something else that's that the world loves and knows that that you witnessed, and and I want you to tell tell the story of of what uh, uh, Ronnie Van Zat said to you on the you know Ed King um, who just we recently lost Ed he was living up here in Nashville he was one of the writers of Sweet Home Alabama right. and didn't he play the opening guitar licks on his Telecaster guitar Yes the okay. uh Yes, I believe it was a Telecaster. And, right. Uh, and, the and, and the opening guitar licks to Sweet Home Alabama are just, you know, iconic. The minute, Iconic. When, Nobody else can play that riff. <laughs> or, when the minute that comes on to be a, a three-chord song, yes. but you, you, you hear two notes, three notes of it, you know what's coming up. Oh, yeah. So talk about what Ronnie says and what he's – and blow, blow their – blow people's minds of what he was saying to you when he was doing his vocal that day. Well, the, the, the thing was, you know, it's kind of like we'd cut the track and I don't remember how many overdubs we'd done on the track at that, uh, that, at that time and everything, but it, it was time for Ronnie to put a, uh, vocal track on there. And so, so I had the vocal mic set up outside in the studio, and I think uh, Ronnie went out there and basically put on his headphones. And when the music started on the playback, he said, "Turn it up," and uh, and uh, the meaning I got was turn his headphones up a little bit because he uh, wanted, wanted to hear real loud. And and that got uh, and Al Cooper had the you know the whatever it was, you know, kept coming over him and kind of leave that on the intro of the song and everything. It's not an iconic thing. And when you hear that, it, it's twofold. You know, I know the real meaning of that, but it, the real, you know, what is perceived as the real meaning of that, this is rock and roll, baby, turn it up. 
<laughs> but he was asking you to turn his head. Turn the uh, headphones up a little bit. Well, and, and there's one other story that you told that I want you to tell right now that where you you got to be the voiceover intro of an Alan Toussaint record. Tell that story. Wow. Uh, uh, Alan Toussaint is a great songwriter, musician, producer from uh, New Orleans. And uh, he came up, he and uh, his partner, Marshall Seahorn, came up to Lefebvre Sound and they kind of liked the sound. They were kind of trying different studios because they were having some pretty good success with some artists Alan was producing. And uh, they got to Atlanta with Lefebvre Sound. That's, they decided that's where they were going to kind of settle down. So ever month or so they'd come up and spend a week at uh, Lefebvre Sound and so we were kind of Lee Dorsey and uh, who was a pretty pretty big artist and everything and so so as an engineer I'm at the console and uh, it's not like digital now where you see time in front of it you can kind of instantly go to anywhere in the song back then you put it you slated the tape which put a low frequency tone on there and you and you'd uh, vocally uh say what take it was and it's like this is uh everything i do from and from now on gonna be funky <laughs> take two <laughs> and it's kind of like so i didn't think anything about it. just you know i like we just got off the turnip wagon from south georgia so everything i do from now on gonna be funky which which is the opposite of what <laughs> but alan tucson he thought that was really cool. And to this day, anybody who listens to that song, I'm still on the intro of that song doing that. I don't ever I never got any royalties from that. <laughs> so who, who, Lee Dorsey was the artist? Lee Dorsey was the artist and he had a, 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 a what was a big sitting in my car, car. And he, oh, yeah, he yeah, had, yeah. yeah, he had a couple of pretty big hits uh, before that. And uh, Alan Toussaint used uh, this instrumental band called the Meters as his rhythm section. And uh, so I cut a couple albums on the Meters and, uh, and uh, several different artists. Alan Toussaint also wound up producing Mylon Lefevre's uh, first, uh, first album. Well, we have one good question here and we're going to wind it up. But this is from my good buddy, Jeff Herring. Uh, and what do you what is the biggest audio change you see coming in technology or the the way way things are recorded these days what do you see anything on the horizon that's big i think the uh the digital stuff will keep expanding to the point that uh <laughs> that any any soul in music you can be, you can kind of uh make it happen without actually somebody sitting there performing anything i think the the kind of you know using the sampling or using the loops or doing adding this or that it's still it's just like you will i think it will continue to be where the, all that is improved and improved on to the point where uh maybe kids you gotta listen to all this stuff the bottom line is kids are gonna listen to stuff and everything and some of them just uh, they they don't really know what they're missing from the uh, old stuff mm -hmm. so i think they're but they're still there you know they're uh they're impressed by what they hear and i think stuff will keep on getting better and better the uh the fact the way we are living right now and everything during this uh covid stuff is uh, a lot of people are just kind of woodshedding at home and it's kind of like you have all the tools in this digital format that allows you to do a lot of things uh I don't think it's necessarily a change, it's just an improvement. And as we go along, I think some people actually go back and listen to some of the old stuff. And, uh, and that still has some relevance. It has relevance to me because it seems like you're in the seventies and, uh, we kind of got to a point where things st started sounding really good analog. Mm -hmm. And I think there is still that kind of mystique of kind of like less, try to recapture what was so good about that analog. And uh, not to the point that I don't think hardly anybody's gonna go back to analog. It's just that everybody, there's some smart people that know what, how the 
what, how that the analog sound came into being, what was the pro, what was the process that happened to make it sound analog and make, make it sound good. And just they got the knowledge to develop plugins and software and everything and replicate that. Uh, so I think that I don't think we're going to go to a point where everything is going to start sounding so good it's completely different than what it was in the seventies. No, I, I, to, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, um, I remember George Martin wrote a book that I read called all you need is ears. <laughs> and that's what I think a lot of people are depending on technology and software, uh, but they're not developing their listening skills, their hearing skills and the comparative skills to what's really, really good. Um, I mean, I know one of the things that, that I did when it, especially when it comes to music is I'd, I'd put something up on my speakers that I know was good, or at least in my opinion, and to see, and then I'd compare it to how far off I was. Right. <laughs> and and that, that just made a huge, huge difference, huge difference. Um, I see Barry not- must be watching this on Facebook. She put a link up to the Amen break. So if anybody in Facebook goes to uh, um, uh, our, our uh, uh, links here, you'll be able to see those. And, uh, and, and one of the things I'm going to tell Jeff is, and I don't know if you've come across it, but there's no way that I know of the internet speeds are not fast enough to do virtual, uh, synchronization. Meaning when it comes to podcasting, we're, we can have a, a dialogue and record it. And we don't know that there's a millisecond time delay. Right. Uh, but when it comes to having musicians, playing together over the internet. I don't know. Have you come across anything that I have not been involved in any of that. So uh, I know that it's possible and, uh, and some people do that, but most, most of the time is it's not an interplay between musicians and everything through the internet. Everything's done piecemeal. Well, what people are doing is they're sending their parts to one another and, and yes. it on their own machines. But there's no there's no way for musicians all over the world to hook up and and record at the same time like you you and I used to do with people coming into a studio right. and playing. So um, I had a friend who is a, a a Microsoft computer expert, and he said that it is physically and um, time wise impossible to synchronize because even at the speed of light, which is what the speed c- computers connect at it's not fast enough to get everybody completely in sync and, and maybe maybe somebody will figure out a way to make that sync up yeah. there, there's no substitution my uh, past several years i've had the opportunity to go up to nashville several times i worked and primarily i worked up there with anywhere from six to seven live musicians in the studio at the same time playing off each other and that's right. an experience of I would not trade for anything. And right. those musicians themselves absolutely love that also. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of like, you know, it's just, you know, you play a couple, few tracks, put it together, you know, pick this part from that part. Okay, that sounded good there, so let's copy and paste it to there. Right. So, it's, so it's more of a, uh, how you uh, go about making a record now as opposed to dealing with a live musician performing. Well, there, there's something to the magic of, of human beings getting together and, and feeding off of the energy of each other um, yes. you know, uh, and listening to music. And, and you witnessed a lot of and engineered a lot of great music. And I, I'm going to wind this up because we've already gone 45 minutes. Okay. <laughs> but uh, this, you know, I could talk to you all day and, and I, I look forward to seeing you again, my friend. And thank you for sharing your life with, with, uh, with this uh, interview. And folks, I'm telling you, Go to RodneyMills.com. I'm, te- I'm telling you, if, I, I used to get people all the time, Rodney, saying, can you make this recording more intelligent to hear? You know, in other words, they had a recording and they, they wanted to eliminate the background noise and stuff. And, I, and that may be some things that, that folks need to know. Go to RodneyMills.com because uh, you're very reasonably priced for your talent. I'm going to tell you that. Right well, now. I've got, kind of gotten that point in my life, Mike, where I'm self-sufficient almost, you know, and it's kind of like, so I don't have to worry about escalating or competing or anything like that. I'm just maintaining. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
<laughs> well, you, you maintain uh, amazingly, and I just can't thank you enough for being here. So, folks, go to RodneyMills.com and, uh, you know, uh, Google, Google Rodney Mills. Check him out. Listen to some of these things. Uh, look at the links that Mary put up. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks with another episode of Mike Stewart dot live uh everything audio and video for the internet bye bye rodney bye bye take care mike